This is an amazing story of God's redemption, and uh, he's uh, going to be here after the service out in the foyer if uh, you want to talk to him uh, and uh, talk with him about how God has redeemed his life. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is our text for today. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, They look amazingly like this one. Turn to page 1,123. That's uh, 1123, and you'll find our text for the day. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please take one of those Bibles with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, most of us desire to live lives that are safe and secure. You guys, you guys into safety and security? Kind of like that? Yeah, I think most of us want that, uh, especially in this uh, unsafe and crazy world that we live in. And, and, and for some of us, security becomes a major obsession with our lives we're all wired a little bit different, but, you know, uh, toward the subject, but we approach it differently, too. So, for instance, I have friends that because of, you know, their concern for safety and security, uh, they have concealed carry, you know, permits. And then I have friends because of safety and security that won't own a gun. <laughs> they, they both want the same thing. They just approach it totally differently. Uh, you know, same is true with, you know, seat belts. You know, I've got some friends that are like, nope, my child's going to be in a car seat until they're 22 years old. And I've got other friends who are like, you know, when I grew up, the car seat was this. And, uh, you know, and their seatbelts are kind of like optional, uh, even though it's the law. And, the, you know, the same thing with locking doors. You know, I've got some friends that if in, they, they can't even sleep with any door unlocked or open, even if there's like a security screen door with a deadbolt on the other side of it. Just can't do it. I have other friends that never, ever lock their house. I mean, ever. Like, I called one and said, hey, we need, you guys have anything? Meralda's fixing something for dinner, and she, she's out of this. And they go, oh, yeah, you can, co- you can go over to our house and get it. We're not there. Just walk in. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> Especially since you have dogs, and, oh, the dogs won't care. Go ahead. You know, and, and I grew up in a family that was obsessive about locks. And I'm, and I'm talking, I didn't realize it, you know, when I was a kid, but they were obsessive about locks. We had deadbolts that were keyed on the inside. It's like, you're not getting out of here. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but my, my parents fell in love with all kinds of locks. Like, they had the kind, uh, a door you can open, but it's still locked on the other side, which is, a, which is a, you know, okay door to have as long as you don't have, like, an automatic closer on it. But my parents put those on, too. So my mom locked herself out of the house so many times, we considered it her hobby. You know, she's, she's always calling us, can you come let me in the house? I lock myself out again. So we want to be secure. We want to be safe. And insecurity, fear, steals our joy. And, and there's a special problem with Christians. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and, and by that we mean you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then... then uh, what happens is we want to, to live life without messing up. We want to please God. That's really good. We want to do God's will. That's highly commendable. But a lot of times we become insecure. We become afraid about what we're going to do, about making decisions, about how we're going to live because we don't want to do it wrong. You know, we don't want to pray wrong, and we don't want to marry the wrong person, and we don't want to get the wrong degree. We don't want to take the wrong job. We don't want to move to the wrong city. So let's be honest, anyone here ever agonize over a decision? You know, a lot of you that didn't raise your hands, are you trying to decide right now? Should I raise my hand? Should I not? I don't know. <laughs> Look, I know we wrestle with decisions. I eat out with people. You know, I don't know what to order. It's like I, they agonize over it. So, so here's the thing. Satan loves our paralysis of indecision. He loves our fear of messing up. He, he fuels our anxieties of imperfection. And he wants us to be timid and unsure. God wants you to be secure. God wants you to be assured. God wants you to be confident and bold. And and this week and next week, we're talking about security. Security. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Christians, the church in Rome. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers." And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Today, I just want to share with you three reasons for you to be more secure, more confident as followers of Jesus Christ. Reason number one, the Holy Spirit prays for us and with us. The Holy Spirit prays for us and with us. Did you catch that? Again, verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Through the years, as a pastor, I've had people tell me, I don't know how to pray, and and I don't want to pray wrong. And and I just want to tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't pray wrong. You can't pray wrong because the Holy Spirit, uh, the moment you confess Jesus Christ as, as Lord, the Holy Spirit of God moved into your life and he is praying with you and he's praying for you. And he interprets your prayers to the Father for you. So that means when you can't put your prayer into words, you don't know what to pray, you don't know how to pray, you you hurt too much, God understands. He grasps your fear, your grief, your concern, your panic, your hope, your longings, all of it. If all you can do is weep and groan, the Spirit interprets that to the Father so God understands. I think that's so cool. I mean, I mean, I don't know if that, you know, helps you or not. I don't know how much anxiety you have about praying. I know a lot of you are afraid to pray in public, right? Because somebody calls on you. I, I do this from time to time. I usually try to ask people, but sometimes you assume, hey, they know, they're, they're not going to be afraid to pray in public. And you call on them, and they look at you like a deer in the headlights, just kind of like, what? And, and then you see their head kind of like going, no, I can't do that. And you can't, like, just bow your heads and wait because they'll just get up and leave. You know, you know, some of you, I get that, it's public praying, but, but there's some people who say, you know, I don't really even know how to pray privately. And, and, and the Spirit is interpreting your prayers. So let me give you some, some pictures to kind of think about this. Uh, how many of you have ever tried to have a conversation with a toddler? Okay, if the toddler is not your toddler... That is a very difficult task because they are learning to talk, right? And you understand about one out of every four or five words. And, and maybe one out of every four or five words is actually a word. But they're talking to you and you're like, uh-huh. And then when the toddler gets done talking, what do you do? You look at the mom. Right? That's what I do. I look at the mom because the mom is going to interpret for you what the child just said. And because most of the time the moms know what the child is trying to say. And if mom's not there, you look at the older sibling. Like, you can interpret? Because I don't speak that language. And they do. The, you know, the older sibling will be like, yes, what they want is two Oreos, one for them, one for me. That's what they just said. <laughs> can you help us out? Uh, and, and see, there's an interpreter there, and we, we do that. And that's what the Spirit is doing for us. We don't know how to ask correctly, and the Spirit is asking for us, interpreting for us. I think that's so cool. And then think of it another way. Especially if you're hesitant about praying because you're like, I don't know how to pray. Do children that are learning to talk know how to talk? No, they're learning how to talk, and so they don't often make sense. And, and has anyone seen a parent look at their child who's learning to talk, who's un, you know, unintelligible with some of their words, and go, hey, I don't want to hear from you until you can get it right? No, you don't ever say, shut up, you're, you're making, not making sense. No, what what do parents do? We encourage them to talk. Why? Because we want them to learn how to talk so that we can engage in conversation so they can express themselves better. Guys, we are born into the family of God. We are born again. We are spiritual babies, and so we have to learn how to talk. 
So it doesn't matter if you know how to pray or not. Try and pray. Talk with God. He will delight in that conversation. He wants you to talk to him, even if you don't know how, and the Spirit is there interpreting for you. You don't have to be afraid because you can't pray wrong as long as you are sincere. As long as you're sincere. You know why? Because God searches the hearts and the Spirit is there, and if you're faking it, He knows. If you're, if you're just going through the motions, if this is just ritual for you, He knows. If you're trying to manipulate God, He knows. So this is about you wanting to have that relationship with God. And as long as you want to have that relationship with God, you can ask for anything you want, and it's never going to offend God. Uh, but you have to be okay with his answer. Because the Spirit prays for you according to the will of God. Did, did you catch that? Because it's the last phrase there in verse 27. The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Which means sometimes we ask and the Spirit tells the Father, <laughs> say no. <laughs> say no. That is not what they need. That is not at all what they need. Here, let me illustrate this. How, how many of you have ever prayed for money? Oh, come on. Seriously? <laughs> Why don't you preach on lying or something? <laughs> Look, I, I mean, you're, you're struggling to make ends meet. You got a bill came due and you're like, God, I need help with this. You know, some of you are praying to win the lottery because you tell me you are. You know, you're like, hey, if I win the lottery, I'm going to pay for the church. And, and so you're praying, you know, hey, I want to win the lottery. I want to I be mega rich and all this kind of stuff. And, and you promise God all kinds of things. God, I'm going to bless other people. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to build the church building. Let me be really clear, by the way. If you win one of the mega jackpots, it's a 20% tithe on the gross. Okay? <laughs> I, I just want to be really clear about that. So uh, I'm praying for you to win too, okay? Just, just so you know. But, but here we, we, we ask for this. We make all these promises to God, and the Holy Spirit says, No, Father, don't give it to him. He'll get greedy. It'll ruin his life. It'll ruin his children's life. It'll ruin his grandkids' life. They'll all leave the faith, become lazy or addic addicts or arrogant or, or, or just walk away, and it'll be a disaster. Let's say no because we love him. Because we love him. So it never hurts to ask God. Just be okay with his answer because he's for you, and the Spirit's praying for you and with you. So have confidence in that. Have security in that. Second reason to have security is because God redeems our circumstances, our failures, and our rebellions. I love verse 28. It's one of the most quoted uh, verses in Scripture. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So if you love God, he promises to redeem every part of your life. That's amazing. It's an awesome promise, but the promise is oftentimes misrepresented in the midst of tragedies. Uh, people try to be helpful and try to be encouraging in the midst of disasters or deaths or accidents or illness, and they say well-intentioned but usually hurtful words. They say things like this, your spouse dies tragically, and they say things like, God has a purpose. Or your child is diagnosed with, with uh, an illness, well, God has a reason for it. Or the, the tr greatest tragedy of all, a child dies, and somebody says, well, God needed another angel. Let me really be clear about this, because I want you to hear this. God doesn't cause evil. God doesn't cause evil. God did not give you cancer. God did not make the drunk driver hit you. God did not get you fired. God did not inspire the suicide. God did not cause evil to happen in your life. A, a, a while back, when we were in Romans chapter 5, we studied this. We talked about this. If you weren't here for that message, then go on to uh, calvarylhc.com. Go to sermons and, and listen to it. Because the reason that there is evil in this world is because of sin. And we live in a fallen world. It's an evil world. And let's be honest, we're evil people. I know, we don't like to say that. We like to pretend that we're all good people. Look, people are good. Really? Do you know people? I mean, come on. I mean, just watch. And, and we're selfish. We're self-centered. And we hurt others because we want to help ourselves and, and, and stuff like that. And if you don't know that other people are that way, just look in the mirror. And be honest about what's in your heart. Because I really don't know about you, but I know I'm evil. And I know Scripture says we all are. 
And, and because of that, this world is broken and it's destroyed by sin because just as through one man, sin entered the world and all sin, therefore all die. God doesn't cause evil. You know what God does? God causes good to come out of evil. That, that's what this passage is saying. For those whom, that, that love God, all things work together for good. God is in the midst redeeming our evil. So we rebel against God. And God even redeems our rebellion. Ted Kamina is our recovery pastor. And, uh, and he is a great guy, but see, for 40 years, he drank his life into ruin. Drank away two marriages, uh, broke his relationships with his kids, uh, just got to the point of wanting to end it all, and he repented. He's now been sober for 18 years. He's been leading Celebrate Recovery here at Calvary for 13 years, uh, and he has blessed hundreds, if not thousands, of lives through his efforts of recovery. God has redeemed his life out of his rebellion. He now is being used by God to help people who are rebelling in similar ways. That's an amazing story of redemption, and, and, and that's how, what God does. He causes good to come out of evil. And we make mistakes. We, we fail, and we f- you know, fail to follow God's will, and God redeems our failures. Have you ever sat there and thought, I- I'm, a, I'm a huge failure, uh, and, and there's no way God can redeem this? You're wrong. But you're also not alone. Pastor Chet, I think you guys know him. If you don't, he was the guy who did the baby dedication earlier uh, this service. Pastor Chet, I was there in his life when uh, his first wife surprised him with divorce papers. Uh, I mean, he was teaching the young married Sunday school class. He was a a deacon in our church. He was a young leader. And uh, and she just out of the blue surprised him with uh, divorce papers and accused him of being abusive. Truth was, she was having an affair. And, and Chet went to the church and went to the leadership and said, I will do whatever you guys ask me to do. I just want you to help me save my marriage. And so they fired him from being a deacon and told him he couldn't teach Sunday school anymore. Kicked him to the curb. And he got to the point where he thought about ending it all. But he didn't give up. And he would tell you today that God has redeemed his life and he's blessed him with a, a faithful wife, uh, a great family, and a, a ministry for the last 14 years here at Calvary that he never imagined where he's been able to bless thousands of people in what he does. You see, God redeems if we don't give up, no matter our failures or mistakes that we make. See, we experience difficult or traffic circ- tragic circumstances, and God is with us, bringing light into our darkness, comfort in our grief, strength in our battle, and he will pick up the shattered pieces of our life and create something beautiful out of them. Did you hear Frank's testimony? I, I mean, he didn't give up. I mean, he was angry at God. He was cursing at God for an accident, an accident that happened. Cursing God. God, it's your fault that I'm broken like this. It's your fault that I'm in pain like this. God, it's your fault. And suddenly one day when he, when he finally recognized Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life, he realized, wait a minute, I would not be the man who I am if it weren't for the pain I've been through. That God had redeemed his pain and his brokenness by turning him into a healer of people who are broken. That God had taken this this you know, young man who didn't have a a direction in his life, and he gave him a purpose where he would spend the next 40 years blessing people in his profession. And what he didn't have a chance to uh, share in the the video, uh, just time constraints, is that when he finally stopped cursing God and started praising God, the pain subsided. The physical pain subsided. It didn't go away completely, but it subsided tremendously. and, And he we just don't have any idea how that anger and bitterness in our souls affects our whole life. So please stop saying or posting that God has a purpose in everything. God didn't cause the evil. Instead, when people are in pain, when they're in sorrow, when they're in grief, just remind them that God loves them, that God's with them, and God will redeem their brokenness if they don't give up, if they don't quit. See, this is why we don't have to live in fear of making mistakes. Because God redeems. And and personally, I love this truth. It helps me to live as the nobility that I am. 
I'm sure there's some other noble people in here. Wait, did you grow up being called a royal screw-up? <laughs> yeah, see? It doesn't matter because if we love God, God's going to take the brokenness and the failures and he's going to redeem them. And we can be secure in knowing that God redeems every part of our lives. Finally, I want you to live confidently and securely because God saved you on purpose and for a purpose. Look at verses 29 through 30. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I know some of you don't like or might be confused by the words that Paul uses there, like predestined and foreknew. Uh, and we're going to discuss this in depth in a couple of weeks, in two weeks from today. Uh, so I'm not going to, you know, ignore these words in this passage and some of the implications. Uh, I just don't have time today to, uh, to unpack all of it. So there's a couple of things I want you to know on the security front. First of all, God wants you in his family. God wants you in his family. Did you notice these verses express God's intentionality? God's intentionality. God wants you in his family. Let that sink in. This is personal. God wants you. You're not just some random person that he adopted just because like, ah, throw them in. I don't know. Kind of like we order donuts. You guys ever ordered, order a dozen donuts? Now, there may be some of you that actually have, like, have a plan, a, a sheet written out of what you want. But it, like me, I go in there and there's like three or four donuts I want and then just throw in the rest. Right? Just, yeah, fill it up with whatever. Give me an assortment. Because I'm only going to eat three or four, and then uh, other people can have whatever's left over. Right? <laughs> That's not how God is. It, you know, he doesn't, you're not just the leftovers. You didn't sneak into the kingdom, and one day you're going to be discovered and kicked out. He wants you. Chose you. The creator of the universe decided you belong in his family. And, and here's, here's the big point, God wants you to be like Jesus, conformed to the image of his son. That's, that's a key phrase, conformed to the image of his son. God wants to change your life by developing your character to look like Jesus. It really is that simple. And we stress about, oh, God, who should I marry? Is this the one? God, what career do you want me to take? God, where do you want me to live? Can I just tell you that God is way more interested in you looking like Jesus than he is about where you live. I, I mean, if you read the Bible from cover to cover, there's a few instances where God tells people to move, but usually he doesn't tell them where to. And, and we're praying, God, this city or that city. And, and here's the thing, just move to a city and live for Jesus. Your character is what God is much more interested in developing than your location. He can move your location, but he wants to develop your character because he wants you to represent Christ to the world. He wants you to be his ambassador to the world. He, he wants you to reflect that. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, who you marry. The Bible puts pretty broad parameters on that. Somebody of the opposite gender who happens to be a believer. There. That, that's, the, that's the biblical parameters. And then when you marry them, commit to them and live for them and bless them in the name of Jesus in your home. And the next time you think or ask, hey, God, what are you doing in my life? <laughs> Usually we cry that out in desperation. Know that the answer is probably trying to conform you to the image of my son. He wants us to look like Jesus. And then God wants you to join the mission. He wants you to join the mission. You are called by God. I hope you heard that repeatedly in that thing. Called according to his purpose. What is God's purpose? Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. You see, God adopted you into his family. God is developing your character to look like Jesus so that he can send you out as his ambassador to a world that doesn't know him. That's what he's doing in your life. And every single one of us can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And, and if you're sitting here and you go, I don't have a clue how I could do that, then we have an equip class next Saturday afternoon that you can go online and sign up for and, and learn more about that. Learn more about using your talents, your abilities, your gifts to make a difference in this community for Jesus Christ. Because here's what I know. The more that you're involved with the mission of Christ, the more security and confidence you will experience in your life. So today I pray that, that this message has helped alleviate some of your fears and given you more assurance and security in your relationship with Jesus. But I know that the main thing in that is a relationship with Jesus. And if you're sitting here and you're not sure that you've experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, then that's what you need to be focused on. And, and, and if there's any doubt in your mind, then after the service, please talk with members of our prayer team Come see a pastor at one of the Connection Centers. Don't leave here wondering. Don't leave here doubting. Let us go ahead and help you be sure that you belong to Jesus. Because God wants you and his family for a purpose. And he wants to change your life and redeem your life if you don't give up.